Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for staying a bit longer and participating in the last session of the day. Um, the concluding session will uh, have a name of wrapping up the uh, current modules on uh, cannabis, medicinal cannabis policies and regulations, and thinking of what have been the most effective and also most difficult uh, uh, steps on the way. Uh, we should have had reporters from the previous sessions, uh, but as they have been plenary sessions, so we are all pretty well aware of what has been discussed during the afternoon. Uh, so we'll just start uh, straight ahead with uh, uh, Dr. Boas Wachtel, who's a medicinal cannabis doctor and activist from uh, Israel and a former member of a parliamentary commission for medicinal cannabis in Israel. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. I'm not a doctor uh, yet. Maybe I will be still. And uh, in the program, it's written that I'm a member of the parliament. I'm not, maybe I will be. Uh, I ran to the parliament in Israel. Uh, I started the Greenleaf Party, uh, which is a cannabis legalization and an ultra-liberal party. Uh, and, um, but I'm here to, first of all, I want to thank uh, Thomas and the organizers for inviting me here. And uh, I'm really, uh, my heart is expanding when I see uh, such a quality and, and, and broad and, and wonderful group of people coming together to discuss medical cannabis. Uh, ten years ago, it wasn't the case. Uh, the movement is gaining ground, and, uh, and it's happening in our lifetime, and uh, everybody that is involved should be very uh, proud uh, of the achievements that are happening. It's not happening in the right pace, in the right places, but uh, we are gaining ground. What I'd like to talk about is the, uh, I'll do a, a comparative analysis of the national medical cannabis programs in uh, Israel, Netherlands, Canada, and Israel. By the way, I'm from Israel. Uh, let's see if it works, yes. Uh, I'm from Israel, and um, what else? Uh, so let's uh, begin. Um, let's see how it's working. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> we will discuss, uh, uh, th there are only three countries basically in the world with a national medical cannabis uh, program uh, right now in place. Uh, the Czech Republic and Uruguay are going to be the fourth and the fifth uh, that are operative. And, uh, and the, uh, these three countries right now with already ongoing uh, uh, programs, national medical uh, NMCP programs, are in complete adherence, in compliance with the UN Drug Convention, yes, in 1961 especially, and with later modifications, but uh, there are variations to the model uh, for these programs between the uh, countries. Uh, of course, there are 23 states in the United States that uh, have medical cannabis laws, uh, already three states that have legalized uh, cannabis, but on the federal level, unfortunately, it's still, uh, they don't recognize the medicinal value, and uh, the conflict between the states uh, uh, that have passed medical cannabis laws and the federal uh, uh, government is uh, really fascinating, uh, 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 and it's sad that, uh, and I hope that the federal government would uh, come to its senses and uh, remove cannabis uh, from, uh, or change the scheduling, uh, and allow uh, the use of medical cannabis in the United States on a national level. Uh, this is the single convention, what you're seeing is the single convention on narcotic drugs, 1961. Uh, and it's, it's not a good slide, but uh, what basically it says that uh, it talks about national opium agencies. For any uh, government to, uh, to produce opium, uh, it actually uh, it could do it under UN drug conventions, uh, but uh, the, and, and the UN drug convention allows that under certain conditions. We will talk it, about it in a second. What I want to say is basically that the national opium agencies, if you replace the word opium with cannabis, you have 
uh, actually a, a model uh, that fits to opium is, is identical to what is happening now with cannabis, meaning the use of uh, uh, medicinal or, or herbal medicines that are prohibited by, uh, by, by, by law. Uh, so they are allowed to use it under the following conditions. So what, are the, what is the model that has emerged from these three countries, Israel, Holland, and Canada, uh, as to uh, the National Medical Cannabis Program? <clears throat> and what is the uh, convention saying? First, you need the political will uh, to launch a National Medical Cannabis Program. If there's no political will, and they talked about the previous panel members about the flexibility that UN Drug Convention allows for states to make a decision whether to move forward or not, if there's no political will in the country to move forward and to establish a national medical cannabis agency, then there's no uh, chance to make uh, progress. Uh, then uh, medical use of prohibited drug uh, is, is possible. Uh, when people say, or when governments say, oh, it's not allowed under, under UN Drug Convention and so on, they are, they are very wrong. And then uh, you need to set up an agency. The, the previous slide that we showed you about the uh, single convention uh, calls for the establishment of an agency, uh, and that agency would uh, manage the medical cannabis uh, uh, program uh, in its entirety. Uh, the same rules that apply to opium for medical use, cultivation use, safeguards, applies for medical cannabis. It's the, uh, it's the same. Uh, once you establish the medical agency, you have to issue tender to choose growers. Uh, and then the agency takes possession within four months after the harvest, and the distribution is done through pharmacies, and it is done by prescription only by physician. This is actually the translation of the previous slide, uh, the previous slide, this one, into more uh, clear uh, model of what is happening both in Canada and in Israel and in the, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, now, I want to go into each country, Holland, for example. Holland was the first country actually to establish the, the agency, the medical cannabis agency. It's done so in 2003. And um, I always start with indications for use. This is a slide from the uh, official uh, office of medical cannabis in Holland. So you can see it's pain and muscle spasm, cramps, nausea, reduced appetite, weight loss, uh, vo against vomiting and so on, long-term uh, neuro uh, neurogenic uh, pain and tics and so on, okay? And um, the, actually the, the, uh, the program in the Netherlands have many problems, problems with, with, the, uh, with itself. Uh, the number of varieties is very limited. We will show you the number of varieties. Uh, the varieties differ from each other in composition, strength. Uh, the, pharmacy, the pharmacy have three varieties available. Today there are more varieties. And it's suitable for patients, uh, depending on the symptoms and the reaction, uh, uh, a reaction uh, differ from person to person. Um, so these are the strains that are now being used in the Netherlands. So compared, for example, to Canada, where they have no limit on the number of strains, and in Israel, that right now is moving from uh, multiple strains as well to, let's say, ni uh, nine strains. In the Netherlands, there are now four strains, okay, with uh, different uh, combinations of uh, THC and CBD. <clears throat> and if you look at the price, uh, price uh, uh, five grams, it's uh, 38 uh, euros for five grams. Okay, so we see a limited number of strains uh, produced by one supplier, by one supplier. Israel has eight suppliers right now. In Israel, they're gonna move into a, a new tender that will choose probably additional uh, suppliers and few of the current suppliers would be uh, 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 stop their, uh, uh, their action. And this graph shows you the number of patients in the Netherlands 
uh, over time. So what happened is, if you look at the red line, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the blue line, in 2003, there were uh, close to 10,000 patients. And then it went down dramatically. So what happened before that? What happened before that was that uh, there was a supplier that was a, uh, he basically was the pioneer in the Netherlands that started supplying, producing and supplying. Uh, the name was, uh, of the company was Mari Farm. And in 2003, there, were, uh, there was a tender. Two suppliers were chosen in this tender. Uh, and one supplier basically remained. The other supplier basically went bankrupt. And the, there was adjustment period between the strains that the patients used uh, before they established the national agency. And the, uh, later on, it went down. It's now slowly climbing. And as you can see from the, uh, uh, the bottom slide is the source from the medical cannabis in Holland showing that there's a, a, uh, a relatively small number of patients in the Netherlands. Uh, yes, they are, have options. They can go to coffee shop and so on. But uh, that is the situation in the Netherlands. So now we talk about the price of uh, cannabis in various countries. Uh, in Canada, it's uh, approximately $7, seven uh, dollars per, per gram. In Holland, it's about $10 per gram for a variety of bedrocan. When you export, the, the Dutch are exporting a uh, few hundred kilos a year to other uh, countries. Uh, and when it reaches uh, patients in the Germany or in Italy or now in other countries, the price goes up to $700 uh, dollars for 30 grams or $23 uh, per, per gram. In Israel, uh, the patients, regardless of the quantity they consume, they pay $3.3 uh, a gram or uh, uh, $100 uh, per uh, month, uh, anywhere from, now it went down to 20 uh, gram to 100 grams. We see in Israel that the PTSD patients consume more, more cannabis than any other group of patients. And then there are uh, the approved cannabis extract medications. Sativax uh, costs roughly 500 English pounds a month, which is $800 uh, uh, roughly a month. And then you have Marinol, which is about close to $700 a month. So uh, you, Sativax is approved in many countries now but the cost is uh, really expensive, and uh, as a result, because it's so expensive, they invested in clinical trials, uh, and they have to recover the cost of the clinical trials. Then, uh, when you invest in clinical trials, your cost of medicine goes up dramatically. If your cost of medicine goes up dramatically, uh, it means that it's cannabis for the rich, because if the national insurance companies don't pay for it, then uh, people cannot afford uh, cannabis in such exuberant prices. This is Canada. You look at the number of uh, indications that Canada have. Uh, really a tremendous number of uh, indications. Uh, so I take off the hat uh, for that. They have not limited the number of indications. And uh, this is a, uh, a, a picture of the old program from Canada. Uh, they grew in a mine, in a zinc mine, uh, the cannabis. That is an example of a bad decision making by, uh, uh, by uh, government because uh, this mine was used for ornamental uh, <laughs> flowers and so on. And then they said, oh, but it has only one entrance to the mine. So from security point of view, it's great. We can keep it. No one comes out that the cannabis would not uh, run away from us or people would not steal it. So we, and then what happened? They had cannabis laced with zinc, okay? And uh, uh, of course, in today's standards, it would have been uh, completely uh, unusable. In the beginning, they uh, sold it and also the markup of the government uh, was uh, tremendous. There was a 1,500% markup on the price that the government paid the grower, and then they uh, took from the uh, patients. 
So about the Canadian, uh, uh, Canadian uh, uh, program, uh, there were, uh, I'm talking about the old program, it was too complex and the application, the application process was too long. That is something to, to, avo to be avoided by other states of other countries in the world. Uh, the fact that they supplied one strain of cannabis, uh, that is a problem. We believe that uh, 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 patients should be exposed to a number of strains because there isn't one strain that fits them all. They have to try a number of strains and, and, and see what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And uh, I won't go too much into the, uh, they went into a, a period of, uh, of uh, fact finding and improvement and, uh, and uh, how the proposed re uh, redesigned program uh, would work. They put in a new program in place, the Canadians, and uh, today they're selling, uh, they're selling dried marijuana um, production through commercial uh, distribution and so on. Uh, okay, I won't go into this. What is, miss what is missing from the Canadian program, uh, today's uh, uh, program? Uh, uh, research funding is lacking. Uh, in Israel, actually, there's better funding for research than in Canada. That's how I see it. There's more involvement uh, in terms of uh, uh, government uh, in, the, in the Ministry of Health to, uh, to help fund uh, research on medical cannabis. Patient education also is lacking. If you have a commercial grower that they uh, produce and send it by mail to a patient, they need uh, education, the patients. Steph Scherer talked about the need to educate the patients. And that is the prob what is the problem with the, the pharmacy uh, model, that the patient goes to a pharmacy and he buys the cannabis and the, and the pharmacist doesn't have uh, uh, enough time to explain him. Uh, so you need to educate the physicians and the nurses. Uh, what's missing guidelines for use in hospitals and old people's homes and subsidies for pool and health insurance coverage, and the price gap on uh, price per gram. This is a purely, in Canada, it's purely commercial competition. So if at one point uh, the industry as a whole decides to raise the price, then the price would go up dramatically in Israel. These are the number of indications, uh, more or less, uh, approved indication, chronic pain, orphan diseases, HIV patient uh, at various stages, in, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, malignant tumors, and PTSD, mostly war-related. Dr. Yuda Baruch here can uh, probably add some of that to that today. Uh, some, uh, is, is, so what's good and what's bad about, about the Israeli medical cannabis uh, program? It has evolved in the last 15 years and today there are almost 18,000 patients uh, receiving medical cannabis. Unfortunately, in Israel, it's the last, uh, it's the last uh, uh, option for treatment. It's not the first option of treatment. For example, if you're a pain, uh, uh, if you're a pain patient in Israel, first they put you on op uh, opiate-based medications, and you have to go through one year on opiate-based medications, and then if it doesn't work for you, you come back, and they tell you, okay, now you can take cannabis. In my eyes, cannabis should be a first-line uh, uh, medication, not a last-line medication. Okay, that's the, the criticism I, I have. So Israel is the third country after Holland and Canada to establish the National Medical Cannabis Agency. Uh, this slide shows here 14,000. It's been up since. And uh, we have here the uh, former uh, director of the National uh, uh, medical cannabis uh, program in Israel, Dr. Yudo Baruch, he wrote about the, uh, his perspective was that a lot of patients benefit from the use of cannabis. Uh, it's another option for in the pharmacopoeia, a higher safety than opiates. And mainly uh, in chronic uh, pain clinics, the problem is that the pain clinics are being pressured by uh, people fear of becoming cannabis clinics. So, uh, from a patient perspective, cannabis is better tolerated. There's no risk of overdose or death. A different mechanism of work uh, can help where, where other medications have failed. Uh, and uh, what strain to use and who decides 
Should the self-growing be allowed? I always said that patients are not gardeners. They are patients. These are sick people. And the government should take responsibility to supply these people organic and standardized medical cannabis like they do with other medications. Like they don't expect uh, someone who has a, a back problem to start uh, 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 grow its opium, you know, to make morphine out of it uh, and uh, do it at home. So why do they expect uh, so, but some patients still like to grow themselves, which should, this is an option that should remain on the table. Okay, but it's usually, it's not a chose, chosen option for the patients. Then we have uh, the national uh, agency, uh, the, in Israel they chose Sarel, which is a monopolistic arm of the agency. It was challenged by the court. Uh, like there is a court case here in the, in the Czech Republic. The growers uh, always challenge uh, the agency's, uh, uh, agency's actions. Uh, the model is that the Sarel which will buy the crop through and will issue the tender. The first tender that was published in Israel was published by the Anti-Drug Authority. The anti it's like, uh, uh, and that was challenged in court and, uh, and it, uh, it was struck down that the Anti-Drug Authority is not the right authority to issue the, uh, the tender. The tender should be issued by the National Agency for Medical Cannabis that has to be established. It doesn't have to be like a very bureaucratic process. It has to be a government decision uh, to establish the agency. You put an office with two people behind it and, and you assign, uh, assign them to work and that is a national agency that can regulate the medical cannabis program in any given country. Okay, there's an uh, option for home delivery in Israel. The distribution is through pharmacies. And there's an option for trial and error to decide which strains work for you. So they can move from one supply to another and from one strain to another, that is very important. And uh, these are the options that the, the patients uh, consume. Uh, so you can see there's a variety of options. The edibles have been banned, unfortunately. The government said you cannot control the dosage in the food uh, or the edibles. The edibles are especially important uh, to some people who cannot smoke or vaporize and so on. So uh, I don't understand this decision. Uh, in in uh, uh, cancer ward in Israel, you can, you can uh, uh, use vaporizers to smoke uh, next to your bed, uh, which is a very uh, progressive uh, state of being. The patients don't have to uh, hide in the backyard in the hospital, in the hospital to smoke. Um, and what are the problems that, uh, uh, th these are, this is a, a, I'm sorry, a sample of the uh, questions that the patients receive. So what are the problems with the Israeli Medical Cannabis Agency uh, program? First, they, uh, the number of uh, doctors willing to subscribe medical cannabis. Initially, it was only Dr. Yuda Baruch that everybody was you know, p pressuring him, you know, and he's been, co uh, been calling him, to, uh, you know, uh, you must give to this guy, he's gonna die, uh, uh, so you can't, and then there were two specialists, and so on. So now the number of specialists in Israel is 30 specialists in different fields, most of them are oncologists. My position is, and I think a lot of people uh, uh, would agree, is that every doctor should have the right to prescribe medical cannabis. If the doctors have the right to prescribe uh, uh, morphium, yeah, uh, for patients, for pain. <laughs> it's like uh, the difference between an elephant and a rabbit, you know, I mean, if he's allowed to give him uh, uh, opium, why shouldn't he be allowed to give him, make a decision on, on cannabis? So the other issues is the better quality control in real time before it reaches the patients. In Israel, the, the growers are still not, haven't reached good manufacturing practices, and, uh, and they are moving in that direction, but it's still not a, uh, a condition. <coughs> uh, reduced THC levels. Initially, there were the, 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 the THC level was tremendous, and I always told the, uh, the growers, this is not THC Olympics. This is uh, sick people, most of them in Israel, never smoke cannabis in their lives, in, that is indifference. Uh, in contrast to other countries like in Canada and the United States that many of them have experience. But in Israel, uh, these are old people uh, and the cannabis use 
uh, statistics is much lower in Israel than in other countries, so they have not, uh, they haven't, uh, they didn't have uh, experience. So they have to start with, with, with a low, low THC, relatively low THC, and see if it works for them, and then goes, uh, if, you, if, the if the first experience of a patient is 23% THC and half a percent CBD, I mean, they, uh, they, uh, they will sit on the couch, they wouldn't move, uh, you know, for half a day. Uh, so that was, uh, that was something that has to be, and it's changing now. Uh, so it has to be covered by the national uh, medical insurance companies. Uh, education to doctors, nurses, and patients have to be improved. Uh, now, when doctors go to medical school, not just in Israel, almost anywhere, there's complete ignorance about cannabis and its role in medicine. Somebody has to take upon itself to develop curriculum for doctors who go to medical school and then <laughs> uh, to know what is medical cannabis and how to, uh, and how to uh, uh, use it in their practice. And uh, <clears throat> so, and this is, a, I'll, I'll, this is the last slide. The, it's a comparative view. Uh, so the number of patients, Holland, there are 3,000 uh, 3, patients, okay? Uh, the model, so we go from top to bottom in Holland. It's a strict, uh, strict adherence to UN uh, drug uh, convention. There's one supplier now, it used to be uh, two, but now uh, there's only one, Bedrocon. The sale is through pharmacies, okay? That's what the UN drug convention uh, calls for that the distribution will be done through pharmacies with doctor prescription. Uh, patient education is online. Correct me if I'm wrong. That is as far as I know. A number of strains are five, and research is very limited. That is the, uh, what's happening in Holland. In Canada, uh, that is the number of patients that I had. Uh, uh, so there are 40,000 patients. Uh, maybe a year ago, uh, Philippe uh, Lucas can correct me if I'm wrong, it's gone to a commercial, uh, commercial uh, uh, model with multiple uh, producers. Uh, number of suppliers is 20 plus, not one. Uh, it's a new program, uh, uh, so uh, there's direct shipment from the suppliers to the patients, so it doesn't have to go through pharmacies. So what it means is basically that the price, if you, if you take away the pharmacies, as a middle, uh, as a middle, as a, 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 from the chain of the distribution, the price could be lower. Once you add pharmacies, yes, then the pharmacies have to make money as well. So it's another like thirty percent on top of the what the uh, government takes and the and the producer uh, uh, makes. Uh, patient education, it's extensive online, and the number of strains is unlimited, which is really wonderful. <clears throat> And the research is gaining momentum. In Israel, there are 18,000. Uh, it's going also to be uh, strict uh, with the UN uh, Drug Convention, meaning uh, producers uh, would say, would, uh, the government would take over the production. The production would be uh, handed to, uh, uh, distributed through pharmacies, and the patients would get the medication from the pharmacies. And uh, there's home delivery now, which is good. This should be an option as well. Um, there are, uh, there's an option for a nurse to come to your home, to the patient, and, and get uh, education, to give education, which is also very powerful. Uh, 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 it's very positive uh, that is not happening in other countries. And the number of strains, there's multiple strains. It's now, uh, uh, the strains are going into one, uh, uh, um, model of 12, uh, s uh, 12 different, uh, I'm sorry, content uh, variations, high THC, low CBD, and all the way to high CBD and, and, uh, and, uh, and low THC. And research is extensive. So uh, just to finish, uh, remarks, Canada is in transition period between the old and the new program. The new program is actually in place. Uh, the model is, the, the, it has different interpretation. Uh, the Canadian model, because it doesn't have the pharmacy, uh, the pharmacy uh, element into it. And then patient education, uh, uh, doctor's education is lacking in all programs. 
there's no, as I said, doctors are reluctant to also recommend smoking. For them, uh, you know, uh, to recommend uh, something in the form of smoking, for them it's a very hard pill to swallow, okay? So uh, that is why there's a process of pharma uh, uh, to develop uh, pills that would be an addition to smoking. In Israel, the vast majority of the patients still prefer the smoking. The smoking and, vapor uh, and uh, 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 vaporization and so on, but slowly smoking will be reduced and then other forms of delivery will come into play. And last, uh, a number of strains, a large number of strains is essential for the success of the program. I have other issues to, uh, uh, to discuss, but uh, just to show you, uh, in, in Italy, for example, uh, they wanted to show, to solve the problem of medical cannabis and they brought in the military. So to grow cannabis uh, in a military compound, yes. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is an interesting slide. What it comes to show you are the prices of uh, cannabis in different places in Colorado, retail, medical, and in the street. Okay, so uh, my last statement is that cannabis should be uh, not expensive for the patients. Many patients go through a personal, physical, uh, familial, uh, family-wise crisis. The economics are being hurt. And if the medicine is costly, then these people cannot afford it. So the price of the medicine for the patients have to be reasonable in the context of what the national uh, the, the average uh, income level in that given country. Thank you very much. Yeah, if anybody wants a question? Uh, maybe if you don't mind, we could keep the questions to the, to the final summary, if that's all right, because we'll invite is that all right? Because that's going to be about comparison of the different models and their pros and cons, so we can easily get back to this. Before I invite the uh, people to summarize the other panels, etc., let me just introduce briefly the changes in the Czech Republic and we can have a broader view of what is out there in the world. Uh, I'm representing the patient uh, organization for medicinal cannabis, COPATS, uh, is the Czech patient organization. Um, I'm a spokesperson to this organization and I'm not a patient myself. Uh, my background is drug policy research and don't ask me how I got into what I'm doing here, probably just pure uh, activism. Uh, what happened in the Czech Republic, uh, it's important to know that uh, cannabis, has, uh, cannabis use and possession in small amounts has never been criminalized in the Czech Republic. And in 2010, uh, we introduced decriminalization of uh, cultivating up to five cannabis plants for individual use. So this is a specific drug policy setting, but it hasn't been a solution to medicine cannabis patients, because if they were aiming to cultivate their own the cannabis plant would be taken from them. Uh, so we started a parliamentary seminar in 2010 where all the stakeholders agreed that uh, it's a good idea to introduce medicinal cannabis in the country and that there are no constraints to this process. Uh, nothing happened for about uh, 14 months and at that point we gathered with activists and with patients and we built up a petition for medicinal cannabis uh, that was uh, a common activity of all the stakeholders, patients, experts, activists, citizens. Uh, just after the petition was released, we had the head of the Czech parliament, a woman in her 50s, uh, who said that she will make sure that the necessary legislative changes are implemented uh, till the end of the year, which was about four months left. Uh, four expert groups were set up with the aim to establish an agency and to change the law so that cannabis can be cultivated in the Czech Republic and so that it can be prescribed upon electronic recipe. And uh, this law was actually passed through the parliament, or this proposal went through the parliament, and uh, all parties uh, across the political spectrum have approved, and the president has signed the law in 2013. 
Uh, it sounds like a story of success, but uh, it hasn't always been easy. Uh, in particular, the health resort has never been very supportive, and that results in the fact that we have very bounding regulations that limit substantially what can actually be prescribed, to whom it can be prescribed. The electronic recipe that was required was never really functional. And um, th as a result of that, uh, we are now almost two years since the law has been active and uh, since there has been a commitment to issue licenses to growers, et cetera, et cetera. And there is only two pharmacies in the country that uh, currently have cannabis available. And there is about four doctors who are eligible to prescribe. Um, one more side comment in terms of the process. We've actually had quite a hard time uh, with the activists who, who would think that everybody should be able to grow cannabis and do whatever they want with it. And uh, our proposal to have uh, actually cannabis in pharmacies and to have it prescribed by the doctor has been labeled as a pharmaceutical model that not everyone is really happy with. So this is just a brief introduction, and uh, I think it's time to invite also the, uh, the participants from the other panels, like Steph Scherer, if she's still around, and uh, whoever might want to take part in the debate then. And uh, we have Jendrik Wobodil, our national drug coordinator. Um, Maybe the, a good thing uh, we could do before we open up to questions would be to just define briefly what is it that we want with medicinal cannabis as activists, as most of us are. Jindrik is a governmental representative, so he might have a slightly different point of view. But to, to say for the Czech Republic, what the only thing we've wanted for medicinal cannabis has been that it's the same accessible for patients as any other type of treatment, so that people who need cannabis treatment are not disadvantaged or set up in any specific type of conditions or treatment. Uh, is this something that uh, we all would agree upon? Boas or Indrik? That's it. Then the idea is if we all agree what's the best model to achieve this. So maybe to Boas, you're out of your summary, what has been the best model? What is it that you think works the best? What is the best model? Uh, the best model is a compassionate model that uh, takes care of the patient. It is a, a patient-centered model. Okay, it's not a government-centered model. It's not the industry-centered model. It's the patient. We are here to serve the patients and to make their life better and provide them uh, safe, affordable cannabis. That's the model in a simple uh, terms. And uh, out of the models that are currently in practice, comparing each, in each country, it's, uh, as, as, as I, I, ex I explained in my presentation, each country has different uh, uh, variations to the model, but my, uh, the bottom line is that it's, uh, it's possible in every country to, do a, to have a medical cannabis program, and uh, the, patient, uh, the patients have to organize. If, they, if the government doesn't uh, uh, implement a national medical cannabis programs, it is the, the patients that have to organize and it needs leadership uh, to pressure the government to issue, to, to, to start a national medical cannabis uh, program uh, if it doesn't exist. So when they have all these excuses that it's not allowed by law and, uh, and there's not enough research and all these, these are all lies. It's all possible. And, and the countries that are now joining the fold in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, establishing national medical cannabis agencies, they can learn from the mistakes that the, uh, that the first countries have, have made and to move forward. And um, it's, uh, so it's, 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 uh, it's, it's possible by the, by the law and they will not be the first. They don't have to invent the wheel. They just have to make the act and do it. Uh, and uh, that's, it's possible to do. <laughs> Uh, Jindrik, you were the reporter of the European model and Canadian model. What do you see as the best way to deal with medicinal cannabis? What would be your summary? Um, I'm not sure if it's the best. If the, if the best thing is at this moment to, to compare the models, um, I uh, appreciate it very much, uh, the, the presentation of our Canadian colleague, uh, and I think this is uh, 
interesting example, uh, which I'm going to report later on, uh, that we feel could be followed, especially after several years of several experience and, um, and uh, changes introduced uh, uh, over the times. <coughs> so I think uh, that lesson is, is good to learn from. Um, in my view, generally, if I can uh, say so, uh, I would like to see uh, in future that uh, cannabis is, and medical products of cannabis are not going to be a big issue. It's going to be a, a usual thing, uh, ostracized from, uh, from any ideology and uh, in the hands of, of uh, science. Um, let's have questions from the audience and suggestions. If you don't mind introducing yourself, and I don't know, do we have a mic? Yeah, we have at the back there. Yes, my name is Arno Hazekamp, and I've been working with the Dutch Medicinal Cannabis Program ever since it was started in 2003 as a PhD student, and now I'm the head of R&D at uh, Betrican, and I was a little bit surprised. No, first of all, I was very happy to see an overview of what's happening in the world, of course, and I think it's very useful to all of us. But I was a little bit surprised to see that it was claimed that uh, there was very, li very little research done with Dutch cannabis because as head of R&D, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, the cannabis that is produced in the Netherlands is probably one of the most researched uh, cannabis in the world together with NIDA material. And I can show you at least 50 peer-reviewed papers on the, the cannabis that we produce in clinical trials and chemical studies and animal studies and all kinds of things. And we address things like uh, Simpson oil production, like uh, vaporizers, the Volcano Medic, for example, was developed exclusively with Betrocan material. So I would like to take a few minutes because we're not presented on the stage just to correct a few things that I noticed in the presentation. Um, for example, there was, there are at this moment six varieties available. Uh, it's true that it's a limited number compared to some other countries, but I think it's not totally fair to just look at the success of a program and the number of varieties available if we don't really know what's the difference and how we should deal with that, or the number of patients served, because are all those patients actual patients? I think that's a thing where a lot of uh, regulators are struggling with, and who's a patient, who's not a patient, who, and who, how do we keep this program manageable? So those varieties are different in their CBD and, and THC content. We are one of the first ones, and maybe the first one actually to produce a standardized CBD variety already in 2007. So we've been on it for a long time. We're now investigating what's actually the difference between the Sativa and the Indica variety, because we try to do this a little bit science-based. So bringing 20 varieties to the market, it's, it's complicated for the patient. It's complicated for the physician, because how are you gonna choose from that if you just dump it into the market? I think there needs to be a more rational approach. Well, at this moment, we produce about 1,000 kilos per year, and that goes to about 3,000 patients. I saw the right number in the table. And in total, and we know this because we've, we've been tracking this through all kinds of databases with prescription data, we served about 10,000 patients over the whole period, so that's quite a large number, and it's growing quite rapidly. And I think it has something to do with price. I think we all agree that price is a very, very essential thing, but quality does cost something. You cannot make it cheaper than it needs to be. Um, but now we are in a situation that initially the price in the Dutch coffee shops was much lower than in the pharmacy, but the price of the pharmacy has not decreased in 10 years, not even for inflation, and actually gone down a little bit two years ago. So now the coffee shops are more expensive and people are flowing into the program, which I think is a sign that it's not so much necessarily only quality or varieties, it's a, it's a cost issue. It's what we know also from service, what we hear from people. Um, there were not 10,000 patients initially that went to the Mari Farm, uh, Mari Farm company in 2003. There were 10,000 people that were estimated by the Ministry of Health to be potentially benefited, uh, benefiting from medicinal yeah, cannabis. So it was just basically... Uh, so more than 10 clinical trials have been done since that time, at least, uh, with, with our materials. For example, focusing on chronic pain, anxiety, Crohn's disease and psychosis, and it includes the CBD varieties and the placebo uh, cannabis that we have developed. And because of all these developments, um, health insurance companies have started to step in 
and they started to reimburse the cannabis in many cases. So yes, cannabis is not cheap, or many drugs are not cheap, but as a patient, you never see that because health insurance, they take their responsibility. They have done so in the Dutch system because they see that this is a rational approach, which they understand there's scientific papers, and they can follow the development, and they can start trusting this material. That's not unimportant, I would say. Uh, because of the standardized content, that means that long-term academic studies uh, and company studies can be initiated because they are certain that if you develop a product today, the cannabis will still be available in 10 years. It's backed up by a national government. It's been standardized for a long time. It's quality controlled, so the Volcano Medic was developed based on this. There's THC tablets being developed called Nemesol. There's a chewing gum being developed called Cantu, it's now a different name, and there's a lot of other pharma companies that start to see that this is an official API, an active pharmaceutical ingredient. So we are GMP certified, we have API status, and this means that the world of normal medicine opens up to medicinal cannabis in a very different way. Well, because it was fully supported by the Dutch government, we were able to also start exporting. Um, there were no activist groups involved whatsoever, except a small group connected to my farm. No, no activist what? There were no activist groups involved in most of the development. We of wouldn't this be here without the activists that in, have in uh, uh, in, pushed in, the. Uh, in Holland. In without Holland. the hippies who uh, created a yeah, counterculture yeah, yeah, yeah. to you know uh, put a mean. question mark on all the uh, uh, facts and, and the lies that were so sold. So without the activists, we wouldn't be here. I'm I, giving need, you I, need, I need you to give some respect to the activists who. Uh, they were oh, I work with activists here. all the time, but they are not very involved. They are in now the being Dutch pushed out. Program, and there were no court cases to push this program. It was all done willingly by the Dutch health minister. So, yeah, I think that's, that's my point. We're talking a lot about uh, education as well, and this is gonna be the fifth year that um, we organize our one week master class in Holland, which has also served a lot of foreign officials and, and scientists, so I think we're also addressing that based on 10 years of quiet, calm, uh, and logical development of a national program. I think that takes pretty good care of their patients. So I just wanted to take this chance to okay to correct a few things about the Dutch program, so now you're open to discuss. Thank you for your input. It's been a mistake to talk about the Dutch without the Dutch. Next time we'll be smarter. But you have the chance to see Dr. Hasenkamp in the tomorrow and the day after tomorrow's session and discuss some of the issues with him. Thank you. I would like to discuss the, uh, the further question concerning the models. Okay, first thing, uh, one thing I think... Uh, can essential. you introduce yourself, if you don't Sorry, mind, to the audience? Dr. Yuda Baruch from Israel. First of all, there's, there's, I believe there's a need to divide between uh, the growers and the patients. There should not be a direct link between them because there is a conflict of interest between the growers and the, pa and the patients. Once you're, li you're eligible to get something for a certain grower and the, the strain or the cannabis doesn't exactly fit you, usually demands that you request a higher dose. It doesn't send you to his... Uh, advocate or to his colleague to see another, to try another strain. Concerning the doctors, I agree with uh, Boaz that every doctor should be eligible um, to write a prescription, but there has to be some regulation on the prescription sent. True, all doctors are allowed, at least in Israel, to write uh, morphine-based or opium-based uh, medication. But if you see the, the, the data that's coming on, especially from the states, Using uh, oxycontin and oxycodone has been the fourth reason of death among young adults. And I don't want to see this happening with cannabis. Okay, and the last thing is uh, concerning quality control. Qu quality control is of course essential, but beware of putting too much quality control because quality, quality controls uh, pushes the price up. GMP costs, GAP costs, and the more you put quality control, the price goes up. And you should see if what you get from the quality control is really essential or is it just, I don't know, an hallucination as a psychiatrist. Thank you. Uh, no, it's uh, all good remarks. Thank you, uh, my friend, uh, about the Dutch correcting me. I'm always open uh, 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 for cor to corrections. And, uh, but uh, if the doctors, to Dr. Baruch, I want to say, uh, if the doctors will be allowed to prescribe cannabis, no one ever died from cannabis. What is the danger? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is a misconception that no one has died from cannabis. No one has died from cannabis as an overdose. But if you look at the literature, especially, especially the later literature, later literature that's coming in, uh, it can cause cardiovascular accidents and <coughs> uh, strokes. 
So it's not exactly that nobody died out of cannabis. Um, yeah, let me shape the debate so uh, and pass it on to the panel. So what you're saying is that what we know from standard medicine, that there should be an intermediary between the patient and the pharmaceutical company, the doctor who's the one who decides what's the best treatment, and it's not the patient who's buying in a shop what's good for him. So that's one reason for the standard medical model. And then when you're talking about quality control, it's again talking about the standard medical do model because the doctor wouldn't prescribe something of which he doesn't know the precise content. So the question is, uh, what's the better model? Is it the standard medicine and taking the herbal cannabis into the hands of the standard medicine? Or is it better to have an alternative system of dispension and recommendations? If you don't mind, I'd ask, uh, I'd give the word to Steph if she'd like to comment on that from the patient's perspective. Well, I, I think that um, cannabis is a it's never going to look like a prescription. I know a lot of people want it to look like a prescription, but there are so many um, factors in, um, in, in how that medicine is going to interact with the patient. Um, their age, their sleeping habits, what they're eating, all of, all of those things affect uh, the patient and, and the medication that they're using. So I think that there, um, and just from my personal experience, as well as um, talking to other patients, um, there, there is a, a period of time where a patient is gonna be trying different things to see what, what really works for them. And I think that what I would love to see would be for a doctor to be involved to the point that they would actually know what that means, right? So a patient could go in and try a few different types of cannabis, bring that label into their doctor and say, this is what was helping me, that, right, so that the, the doctor could weigh in on the, the pharmacological effects and really see what, what other medications can be taken away from that patient. Um, something we don't talk a lot about around medical cannabis is that you, you are adding something else to your regimen, so what gets taken away, right? So if you're using cannabis instead of something, that's not something I wanna recommend to a patient, yeah, stop taking that medicine. It's something that their physician should, should be doing. Um, but I think that, um, that cannabis is, you know, that, that it's more like a, an herbal medicine than a, a strict phar pharmaceutical product. And so um, I think it's in a, in a time where um, so much is expensive for patients. Uh, if you have a medical condition, even if you do have health insurance and have those things covered, loss of work, I mean, there's so many compounding costs um, that it's pretty exciting to be able to cultivate your own medicine. Uh, in the same way that you may maybe grow specialized tomatoes or those things. And so I think that it's dangerous um, that uh, to say either or, because I don't think either program is perfect, and I think that the answer is actually um, somewhere in the middle. And so I think it's good to compare and contrast programs to see what piece is working better. But um, from a patient's perspective, we, I don't think we've achieved that yet. Would anyone else like to take up further on this, whether it's better for medicinal cannabis to be the standard medication that the doctor prescribes? And now we can talk about herbal cannabis being prescribed and getting rid of the debate that the single compound medication is not so effective. But just this debate, whether it should be an alternative system or the system that takes everything that the standard medicine does, including the pharmacy, the prescription and dosage. We have the three people, hands up. Farid. Uh, we start with, uh, uh, yeah. Yes, my name is Holger Rönitz. I'm, uh, I'm one of the founding fathers of THC Farm, which used to be a patient initiative and has been supplying Dronavinol to approximately 20,000 patients now in Germany. Um, I think the overall problem is not what is really better, but one of the key issues for me, and that's why we founded uh, the patient initiative, is that we would want to see actually companies being reimbursed and patients being reimbursed. Because at the end of the day, I think it is a bit of a tricky um, system when people are, some people are able to afford it and some people are in a niche market where they get it. But overall, in Germany, we've been fighting so hard actually to get the palliative care patients into a reimbursement program. And that was particularly hard and it only worked because we are GMP because we have 18 years of experience, because it's standardized, 
and because people know that the overall costs are between 250 euros and 500 euros and affordable, and that actually works, you know. And I think there is still a market and there is a demand for other uh, work with cannabinoids, and I think that the whole thing needs to be much uh, more uh, explored in depth. But at this point, I think you do have to make a choice as well, whether you think it's okay that people who can afford it can buy cannabis, you know, or whether you want that the most affected uh, people with the most severe uh, um, conditions, that they will have a very good chance to get their need, which probably can be done by dronabinol and other things, that they can get it reimbursed. You can. So the benefit of the standard medication system is healthcare reimbursement that you can't get otherwise if it's a parallel system that doesn't comply. Well, I would just add, you know, in the in the U.S., um, Marinol is only covered by um, it's it's less than two percent of the of the insurers, so it's actually thirty dollars a pill um, for a patient anywhere in the United most like ninety percent of the patients in the U.S. to get Marinol. So, I think that if um, you know, again, I th I think that 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 we should be looking at models that work, and and some of that is going to be based on how insurance works. Uh, in the U.S., there are um, uh, moves towards complementary alternative medicines being added to insurance. So uh, because of the work of patient advocates, uh, for instance, chiropractic care is now covered by, by some health insurers. That wasn't the case 10 years ago. So I, and, and the same thing with, with vitamins, herbal supplements. Some insurance companies are doing those, some, in, in some state health programs are including in those. So again, I think it's... We could be looking at models, and I wouldn't say that just just because it goes through that process, it automatically means the government's going to pay for it. So I, I'd like to add something. <clears throat> I think the uh, governments are kind of prisoners of the pharmaceutical industry uh, paradigm. Uh, I mean, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry paradigm, everything has to be standardized and so on. The truth of the matter is that uh, cannabis has been around as a medicine for 5,000 years without standardization, without GMP without GAP and it was working and it wouldn't have gotten here if it wasn't uh, efficacious. So now uh, for the governments to use this uh, excuse that everything has to be standardized and so on, it's okay if cannabis is not 100% standardized, I mean it should be organic for sure, but uh, because it's so safe, it, uh, it's still uh, there's a room for variation uh, uh, and the fact that the uh, insurance companies don't uh, uh, recognize and, and cover it, uh, that is because they collaborate with the, uh, uh, with the uh, pharmaceutical industry, and that is the paradigm, the mental paradigm or, or the reality that they work with. Uh, that's my uh, thinking. So maybe adding an additional question, whether everyone should have the right to grow their own because it's so harmless. You can, you can answer the previous question or build up on the next one. Yeah, 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 you had your hand up. Oh, you have your own question. You can also <laughs> ask questions, of course. Sorry, my name is Frederick Polak from the Netherlands. Is this working? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I will not mix in on the dispute about <laughs> the Netherlands and the, because I have another question. What I'm not certain of is what would be better to have a prescription from a doctor or the system of the US or California that the doctor gives a recommendation and, and that has to be renewed from time to time. I find myself in Holland that the prescription, uh, the necessity to write prescriptions makes it unnecessarily more of a burden for the patient because uh, when, it, uh, when it's going well, you don't need to, to have a new prescription every uh, few months or every, the maximum for a prescription in Holland is half a year because you can have it continued and that is adding to the costs of the, and if it's going well, I wouldn't see why this is necessary. Uh, um, this may have to do with the position of cannabis that it is, it's not a medication like uh, aspirin or like, uh, like other tab, uh, substance or antibiotics. It is a herbal medicine. And um, 
wouldn't it be possible to, to have it organized more like other herbal medicines then is, is a question that I've posed in Holland to some people already, but I never get an answer to this. And I must say, I haven't made a real study of it myself. But this is maybe in Germany, is a country where herbal medicine is at least much bigger than in Holland. Yeah. I don't know if there are sufficient. Less than 4% of um, the Netherlands population use um, vitamins and supplements. It's actually one of the smallest consumptions in the world <laughs> is in Holland. Because you guys are so healthy, um, I think. I, I, I don't know. But also prescription drugs. Actually, uh, Holland uses, it's like the, one of the least amount of just any, any, any drugs is actually in Holland um, in, in the pharmaceutical um, program. But in, in all of the U.S., there's only a recommendation. There's no prescription. A prescription means in the U.S., the definition is actually a contract between a doctor, pharmacies, and the DEA. Right? So it's an actual contract that they're saying, I'm allowing... Oh, and the patient. So that, that's what a prescription means. Advising. Advising. And yeah. recommendations are, um, yeah, like a doctor recommends herbal supplements or recommends chiropractic work. And they're, um, in complementary alternative medicines, if your main physician recommends chiropractic work, then it can be covered. Uh, in some states, if your doctor actually recommends that you take a certain vitamin, you can get reimbursed. Um, and, and what is better, I'm, I'm not certain. I mean, there's, I think that one of the challenges that we have is that um, if we could create a vacuum without 30, 40 years of everyone having an opinion about this substance um, and could create the perfect program without the politics, without the lobbyists for law enforcement and pharmaceutical companies, I think we could probably come up with an amazing program, right? That, that would make sure that patients were getting everything that they wanted, but we're, we're not. And so our challenge is how can we introduce a substance that everybody already has an opinion about into a country in a new way? Um, yeah, I'd like to follow up on this question, if you don't mind, uh, the difference between prescription and recommendation. The way how we understood it when we were analyzing the abroad models actually was that recommendations in the U.S. work out of necessity, that uh, it's because the federal government doesn't allow cannabis as a regular medicine. That's why the doctors can't prescribe and they have to recommend because they're not then liable for the treatment. And uh, uh, we thought that this is also the reason why in many uh, U.S. states the medicine and cannabis programs are out of control, if you don't mind me saying this. And they're shedding a bad light on, medic on, on medicinal patients because there is a lot of recreational users who, based on this recommendation, a piece of paper that means nothing, and where there is no registry of how much cannabis is being dispersed. So we thought that this is not a good way to go for the patients, and that's why we wanted to prescription. One additional reason is that if the doctor prescribes, he sees the dosage, he, go, he negotiates with the pharmacy, and he can follow up with the patient. Rather than recommending something that he doesn't know the content, he can't really say how it interacts with the other medications, because it's just something that he's not really, he doesn't really know what he's recommending, basically. Yeah, we had uh, we had a question earlier on in the front. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not going to tell my name again. I hope everybody <laughs> already knows. Uh, uh, coming from a, a country where medical cannabis is not is not really an issue of a public of a public debate yet. Uh, I have to say that uh, most of the people that use cannabis as, the, as a medicine in Slovakia uh, only want one thing from the government, and that is to leave them alone. And uh, they know exactly what they, what they use, they know where they get it, they know how it was produced, they produce it maybe themselves, they make creams, they make oils, they make all kinds of stuff uh, that would take 15 or 20 years to be at least recognized by the state, and then another 15 years to be re regulated fairly. And uh, probably if we talk about 
how we are going to set the system, we should not forget about these people because all they really want, they don't want the state to pay them anything. They don't want doctors to tell them what to do. They don't want the Ministry of, of uh, Health Care to tell them what's best for them. They know it themselves. All they want is to be left alone. And uh, whatever system, uh, whatever system we're going to make for the rest, we should never forget about these people because they are the ones that actually started it. And uh, we have a case in Slovakia from last week where a woman that treated herself with cannabis and then uh, was uh, accused uh, of, of breaking the law hanged herself because she was not able to take it anymore. And uh, in the name of people like her, I know that the discussion between the different types and models of the system is a good thing. But let's not uh, eat the whole topic where it began and it is to help the concrete people who didn't want anything else from the government or from the state or from the organizations than just to leave them alone because they knew best what to do. Thank you. I think this is about uh, how the context matters. How does the drug policy context matter to the medicinal cannabis debate? What do we do in countries with strict prohibition towards cannabis and what we do in countries where it's not so prosecuted? If anyone wants to move yeah, that. has been asking for a long time. Because Slovakia, for those who don't know, is very different in its drug policy from the Czech Republic, despite once it's been one country. My name is Farid Gaywesh. I'm from France, uh, Chambre Liberté, Cannabis Without Borders. I'm sorry, I'm not so deeply involved into the medical and research uh, and scientific uh, purpose, but I'm deeply involved into policy. And last week, uh, I've uh, watched and uh, at UN level, there was a, a new um, resolution presented and supported by China in order to put in Schedule 1 the ketamine. And lots of countries uh, reject it with the main argument saying that if you put ketamine as a Schedule 1 substance, then for the poor countries, for the poor people, we will have no way to help them to, uh, for instance, when the, in Haiti there is a big catastrophe, when you make an emergency uh, help, then you will, uh, Switzerland will not be able to bring in Haiti uh, ketamine because it's a Schedule One substance. And so lots of rich countries went against the Chinese uh, will to uh, schedule uh, ketamine as cannabis is or as heroin is. And this is uh, just uh, an idea about uh, actually China wants to make uh, ketamine as a Schedule One substance. And maybe we could use the same wording in order to try to withdraw uh, ca cannabis from this Schedule One. And uh, mostly because uh, first, uh, the scientific expert committee from the WHO has already recommended in the 90s, then in 2003, again, to withdraw cannabis from Schedule 1 and put it maybe in Schedule 3. And so that could release and make uh, cannabis available in, um, in uh, I would say, a more uh, broadened way. And so that's some things that uh, uh, came to my mind when you were talking about this pharma pharmaceutical lobby. There's a fact that, uh, and I will just finish on this reflection, I think that uh, globally we have uh, uh, inst installed for one century a kind of uh, uh, international drug control in order to uh, ensure that uh, uh, for scientific and medical purpose, those substances should be uh, under control and we have to fight against 
against its diversion and, uh, and to fight against the organized crime. And finally, uh, when we look at the last report of the INCB, and this is an article published today by The Guardian, we look at the, uh, the last uh, sentence and we see that more than five million people around the world are still suffering because they don't have access to painkillers. Yeah. And we know that cannabis is also a quite good painkiller. And it's also one of the arguments that uh, leads us to uh, try to change this scheduling. And my uh, reflection is that uh, uh, until now, what we have seen is that this uh, uh, so-called control, drug control, this so-called control for medical and scientific purposes is finally the organized crime because we don't want to leave the people uh, to have a direct access to plants. We don't want to have the, to leave the patient to have a prescription. We, uh, even if it's written that we can make it just for medical and scientific purpose, still in France there are patients that are prosecuted, uh, prosecuted. There are still doctors that cannot prescribe. There are still pharmacists that are looking for uh, giving some medicine to, their, uh, to uh, the people. And that's so ugly. So can we work together in a way to uh, try to reshoot the law, to declassify or to put out these plants, those plants from the International Narcotic Drugs Board? Thank you for pointing out uh, the treaties. We have uh, time for two questions. questions. We've had a hand up from uh, Dr. Hasenkamp for a while, actually. So let's do, and from the back there, so let's do three questions, Dr. Resnik, and the two additional questions in the front. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for giving me th this opportunity to reflect some uh, things that uh, were pre presented here. First, uh, as a physician, I, I would like to say that the from doctors' perspectives, we suppose to uh, to use medical model and not a, a free model like uh, this political uh, uh, person provide us. Leave us alone. We know better. Here we discussed medicinal cannabis. We, here we discuss medicinal issues uh, within the medical model, current existing medical model in everywhere in the world, because the basic medical education is supposed to have a good patient-doctor relationship, and I will reflect it more in my lecture. So I would like to continue to, uh, to uh, think about how we could provide to our patients best and efficient and less harmful medication and the treatment way. In this way, I suppose that we should uh, increase that uh, safety issues and not to reduce it, to say, uh, as an example, placing the growing facility in the sink mine. So we're supposed to increase safety issues and to control it much better that is controlled now everywhere in the world. Second um, do you issue... Have a question or... Is that... I would like to reflect uh, another... Uh, uh, thing. This is a cost of uh, how much does it cost for, for patients. For example, when I uh, worked in the uh, geriatric facility, we reduced the whole cost for all this treatment of all the patients for l less than 20% that they had before because we gave them cannabis. So the money is real issues. The cost of treatment is real issues. We could not charge our patients like it's uh, doing now. But the, but the money should come from the, from the uh, insurance and not from the patients. So when I asked in Israel the uh, major insurer, please uh, provide us the data, or how, how much do you, exp what, what are your expenses for patients uh, that had the license, no one from the insurer were ready to provide the data. Why? Why? Because, because we have a very good reduction of the cost of the treatment for such patients that reduce their, medi their medications. We should, uh, this is money that should come to the patients in the way of the better and less harmful treatment. Yeah. And not forgetting that growing around is usually for free, right? So that's the competition we're facing. So let's have the two last questions in the front. Thank you. Oh, the two questions, if you Whoever wants to go first. Yeah. Hi, it's me again. And I'm not going to bug you about which You're system is the best, but no matter which system is going to be used, I think there's one thing that has not been discussed yet, and I would like to also respond to the 
gentleman over there who said that patients know where they're getting things, you know, and they know their suppliers, they know what they want, just leave them alone. But I think we all know that that's not really the case in the, ro in the, in the, in the world because there's a big trade in cannabis products. Like CBD oil is a very good example. There's a huge, huge market coming up. And you start to see in almost every country that I know, and I've, I've been involved in many labs and setting up laboratories and, and lots of quality control, you can see that the first scams are coming up. So I want to talk, the standardization is more than always having the same exact content of cannabinoids, which is something that was addressed, I, I agree. That may not always be necessary, but the other part of pharmaceutical cannabis is quality control. And I'm speaking of pesticides, on heavy metals, on fungi, <coughs> on bacteria. Uh, I know a situation where a mercury thermometer had fallen into a water basin and it broke. And people went to their boss and they said, you know, this happened, it's in our water system, we have to destroy this crop. Yeah, but it's a $50,000 crop. Do you really think I'm going to throw it away? Make an extract or something. No. So these things really happen all the time. And I think definitely Steph has been involved together with Jehan in certifying labs. Because even if you have a lab, the lab just makes numbers. But the numbers mean nothing if the lab's not validated. So where's the solid basis where you can say, yes, I trust this medicine? Because if people use it to get sick, they're chronically ill, they cannot be helped with other medications in most countries, so they're very vulnerable. You do not want to cure your cancer with the cannabinoid, but create another cancer with the mercury that's in the same cannabis. And this is something independent of any system that needs to be involved. Yeah, it's it's somewhere yeah. needs to be a step through a lab. It's good to mention that the, the fact that you can't overdose doesn't mean that you can't harm your health. And it's a moral hazard if the governments fail to provide a treatment that leave people to their own. So let's try a question at the end. Let's see. Yeah, I, I have to make a comment also about China, so I'm going to start with that. <laughs> Try uh, no, a question, please. I, I've, been a, I've been a consultant to the Health Ministry of China for 25 years, and so I know these guys very, very well. And they're actually moving, uh, although they have asked for the prohibition of ketamine, they're actually moving in a direction in which they do recognize cannabinoids as medicine and clinical trials organized, uh, you know, in order to take a care of, you know, that issue. Now, what's interesting about it, first of all, is that the Chinese are after two indications. Number one is chronic pain. Interestingly, China will not use opioids to treat pain. And the reason being, those who know Chinese history, you should know, you know why, and that is the opium wars and so on. They're culturally adverse to doing that. So and they cannabis. want an alternative. Yeah, they want an alternative, which is cannabis, which I'll get to in a second. The second one is they also have some huge uh, public health dilemmas that would probably be better treated with can cannabis or cannabinoids than it would be from the standard methods that they, or the standard treatment methodologies that they've gotten from the West. So uh, China is moving in a direction of liberalization in terms of cannabis and being open to the idea of cannabinoids as medicine. And it's been an exciting thing to watch unfold in China. Right. So, uh, and so therefore, if they, you know, they're, they're, they're desire to outlaw ketamine is not because they want to get it in line with cannabis policy or anything like that. Now, the other thing that's interesting about China that is actually quite applicable here, and that is you had asked the question, uh, and that is how, you know, or it's been sort of coming up as an undertone, is how in the heck can we approve cannabis, you know, medical marijuana, or medical, you know, or you know, medical cannabis, whatever you want to call it. And in actual fact, the Chinese have a mechanism that could be replicated by other um, regulatory authorities. Uh, and what they do is they have what's called a dual track system. Number one is the Western Pharma model, where uh, I'll be talking about that tomorrow in my talk. But the other one is, and this is one that really should be considered, and that is that they have a, uh, what I'll call a, a nutraceutical or herbal model. And what they call it is traditional Chinese medicine. If it appears in the China Pharmacopoeia, you can approve something under the traditional Chinese medicine model, which means simply, and by the way, cannabis qualifies very, very well, and it's recognized in the China Pharmacopoeia. There's one, one particular reference that is applicable to this law. Uh, and what that means is you can take uh, a cannabis plant, uh, and the closest thing I could see here so far today was actually your discussion, the kind of cannabis that would be used. You know, in other words, it's not standardized, but consistent is really what you're going after. And uh, that model uh, allows you, the traditional Chinese medicine model, allows you to move product through the system uh, as an herbal or a nutraceutical, whatever you want to call it, 
and at the same time, otherwise, it has to go through the same kind of approval procedures that you would do for a Western Pharma. So for example, institutional review board studies, comparative this, comparative that, toxicity, safety, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, I think cetera. we understand. Yeah, yeah, anyway, so it's good. Now, what my question. <laughs> I only had to react to China because yes, I'm here please. all the time. Okay, the question, Boz, is this, uh, and, 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 uh, is that I, my understanding of the, chi uh, of the Israel situation is that they're going to be pooling cannabis to create their different, you know, varieties. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, see, now the problem with that, and this is why I liked what he had to say, the problem with that, and I want to know how, if they're addressing it at all, is that when you do that, Okay, it's great to say you're going to have X amount of CBD, it's great to say you're going to have X amount of THC, but what about A, the other cannabinoids, what about the terpenes, what about the other goodies that are in the plant, and how in the heck are they going to, you know, what, what that means is as they mix these things, if I'm getting it from different farms and trying to get different mixtures, in actual fact, the background's going to vary over time, so therefore there may be uh, uh, an inconsistency in patient response from batch to batch to batch to batch. The short answer to that is, uh, uh, is that uh, if there are 12 varieties in the table from high THC to low CBD and vice versa, that on each variety there will be 30% variation, okay, in itself because the plants are not, in Israel, they don't grow it indoors, they grow it in greenhouses. And when you grow it in greenhouses, you cannot have, uh, you know, the same standardization that you have when you grow it indoors like in the Netherlands where, uh, you know, you get the same conditions, uh, you know, year round. So uh, each strain still have a 30% variation on each cannabinoid. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's their, uh, the answer. It's a problematic approach, but the Ministry of Health feels that they have to come up with a table with, the, with these numbers of THC and CBD and CBN and so on that they can live with. Uh, because it's going in the direction of standardization. I mean, that's, that is, they're coming from a pharmaceutical paradigm, and cannabis is going into a pharmaceutical paradigm, from the herbal paradigm to the pharmaceutical paradigm, and the people who run the programs, the national programs, are, have all pharmaceutical background, and it's all coming to, uh, you know, to very uh, accurate and, and measurable things which is, uh, you know, cost money. So the bottom line from my point of view is we have to have a balance, a balance between cost and quality and accessibility and so on. So that, is, that balance between all these elements, that is the model that I think have to emerge. And beyond that, the patients themselves have to organize, I repeat it, they have to organize and put pressure on the governments to move the politicians, the, poli for the pol politicians have a serious addiction problem. They're all addicted to status quo. They don't take serious decisions, okay? They don't really care about people's health. They care about their seats in the parliament and their pension plans. So they don't take controversial decisions. So the patients and their families, and this is a horrible story that you're telling me now, that this patient that killed herself, you know, because of government pressure. You know, it's, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, you, use that, but this have to go to the public and the public, the Czech public have to, uh, uh, you know, make a, a, a big issue out of this, that a, a patient died because of government interference in his uh, selection of a, of a medicine that, that he took. That is, that has to be publicized and, and, and people should stand trial uh, if, if they, if they uh, 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 human rights and the patient rights were, were abused and, 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 uh, and hurt. So let's make a final rhetoric question that the panel members can, can reflect on. Um, so is it uh, just a herb when we're talking one, one about question. medicine? No, 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 no last questions. Oh, okay. Okay, so. um, <laughs> there is one question and it's a, it's a question I want to ask the panel members. So is it just a herb when we talk about medicinal cannabis and shall we just treat it as a herb at the end of the day? Steph. Let, let's make a Indy. vote. Let's see who, who, who in the crowd uh, <laughs> believes that it should be uh, treated as a herb and uh, who should uh, as a medicine, mm -hmm. uh, maybe. Well, Steph? Yeah, I think, um, I, th I think it depends on, I mean, I, I wish it was an easy answer, yes or no, it should be treated like an herb. But herbs are, are treated differently all over the world as well. Um, 
you know, uh, Canada actually has a really wonderful program for herbal medicines that regulate herbal medicines. The U.S. has a horrible program. Um, and so I think that, um, that, the, that the, the question is, you know, is, is more of, that I think you were going to ask earlier about, about individual cultivation. And I think that while we're talking about just medical cannabis, as much as I hate this, is we have to always talk about the prohibition as well. Um, for all use, right? It's, it, it's, it's, there's no way you can talk about one without the other. I think the, the, what I look at is just making sure that when we come out of that dialogue that there's a market for both um, that separates. Uh, and, you know, they can, they can definitely learn from each other, right? Um, for recreational use, the same um, ban on the pesticide list is going to be the same, right? Just because you're healthy doesn't mean you should be smoking horrible pesticides, right? So there's definitely lessons that can be learned from both. Um, but I think that that um, that this is a traditional medicine. And I think it's something that, that, that again, we're trying to sort of reintroduce something back into our cultures. And in, in um, countries that have a history of working with herbal medicines, um, it may be easier, uh, like Czech Republic, um, where there, there are, there is more of a history here of people using natural products and cannabis is is pretty available um, and it's great that there's also a program but for other people it's not um, and so I think that um, that we have to be mindful of the people like the, the gentleman just mentioned from, um, from his country that have been making products that work for for those conditions and figuring out a way that you know um, something I often say in the United States is that it should be treated like other agricultural products as far as regulations go. So if I want to grow tomatoes for myself in the United States, as long as I'm not being a nuisance to neighbors and I'm not uh, and, and breaking environmental laws, I can do whatever I want to those tomatoes if they're just for me. If me and some of my friends want, together, want to get together and grow some tomatoes, again, as long as we're not being a nuisance to neighbors and we're not breaking environmental laws, we can do whatever we want, but as soon as we put that onto a commercial market, as soon as it goes out of my homes, out of the relationship between your grandmother and uh, and the granddaughter, or uncle and, and aunt, then we have to have product safety protocols because as much as we want to believe that this is the medicine of the hippies, uh, the new companies that are involved, I don't think ever met a hippie, and they're definitely pushing products that are, that are frightening on patients and taking advantage of, of the, the, uh, the lost promises of traditional medicine. Hindrich, is it just a herb when we talk about cannabis, the national drug coordinator? <laughs> what, what do you think? Put it in your spaghetti. Oh, Shall I speak as a national drug coordinator or? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or as a medical patient? As a national drug coordinator, I have to remind that uh, we still have those conventions uh, <laughs> that uh, we have to work with, and uh, we cannot avoid it. That's uh, that's the issue that uh, that is still there. And uh, and uh, whenever we want to bring this uh, debate to evidence and uh, and uh, science and uh, speak about uh, medical uh, use, we always have in the background uh, the issue of the conventions and this this particular herb or drug is, uh, is uh, one of the ban, uh, 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 plants. Mm -hmm. uh, so I cannot avoid this, yes? Yeah, uh, otherwise, uh, as a decision maker, I would like to hear science and I, I, I don't want to be myself deeply involved uh, in, in all the um, and knowledge about uh, what kind of uh, uh, type of uh, is part of uh, the cannabis is uh, is helpful to what what uh, part of uh, uh, what what kind of illness I would like this to to hear from medical society I need I would like to hear this from science I would like to hear clear answers and uh, and. and uh, my wish is to act rationally. So um, I think this is, this is all I can say. And I am uh, quite uh, 
uh, happy to hear all, all your opinions and, uh, from all sides, so uh, this is uh, quite useful. And uh, boss, did you uh, want a public yeah, vote uh, or ju ju final just comment? Just to summarize, I think people are getting uh, a little uh, uh, We're off. Yeah. And then a question from this gentleman. No, 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 no more uh, questions, no? please. <laughs> okay. So, uh, in my conclusion is that maybe the Chinese have it right for the rest of the world. Maybe we should go the herbal way and the pharmaceutical way. Uh, so the patients should choose which uh, option to adopt. So the regulatory authorities should go both the uh, nutraceutical or the herbal way, which is less expensive and more natural and so on, and then there's the pharmaceutical way which is uh, adheres to the mental paradigm of the, of, the, uh, of the pharmaceutical industry and the government and the UN Drug Convention. So maybe the, the, the model has to be a split model and the patients have eventually to make the decisions. That's my... Uh, <laughs> okay. So as for myself as an activist, I'll just vote and uh, that's all. Thank, okay, thank you. you very thank much. you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you so much. Three announcements. The first one is health oriented. So you've been a wonderful audience and you just remove a quarter of my organizer trauma stress disorder. Thank you so much. B, in quarter of an hour there's a reception for those of you who have the shares because during the registration they ticked it and paid for it. Uh, C, there's a program tomorrow starting at 9, and I'm really looking forward to all of you. Don't forget, it's 9 0 sharp. <laughs>